Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to start maybe two minutes after the hour, just to allow as many people to um, join us as possible. So just hang in for just a couple minutes. Looks good. I'm just going to wait maybe one more minute and then we'll get started ASAP. All right, so I think in the interest of time, we're gonna get started. Um, hello everyone, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join this webinar, Protecting Lake Ontario, a National Marine Conservation Area Initiative. My name is Sam Cava. I'm a Nature Network Organizer at Nature Canada, working on protected areas initiatives, including the one you'll be learning about today. I'm currently speaking to you from unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory in Ottawa, Ontario. I'm also joined by Gary Shunivasan, Director of Policy and Campaigns at Nature Canada, as well as John Hirsch, President at South Shore Joint Initiative, both of whom you'll be hearing from very soon. For those of you who are not familiar, Nature Canada is a national conservation charity, one of the oldest in Canada. We work with a network of over 130,000 members and supporters and more than 1,000 nature organizations to help Canadians defend, discover, and restore nature. We have a long-standing partnership with South Shore Joint Initiative, who for many years have worked to protect the Prince Edward County South Shore. So we're here today to tell you more about the urgency and opportunity to protect Lake Ontario through a National Marine Conservation Area, or NMCA for short, and invite you to be part of making this happen. Here's the agenda for today's webinar. I will be starting off with a bit of an introduction followed by a more complete overview of the opportunity by Gary. Then John will be speaking about Eastern Lake Ontario and why it's such a special area that would benefit from greater protection. And to end off the webinar, I will be providing you with details on how to take action because your help is crucial, followed by your opportunity to ask questions. <coughs> if questions arise during the webinar, feel free to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer them right at the end. So I think it's safe to assume that many of you were drawn to this webinar because of your interest or even passion for Lake Ontario and the Great Lakes as a whole. And since I'm all about transparency, I need to make a quick confession. Prior to joining Nature Canada and thrown into the world of freshwater protection, I'm embarrassed to say I, I knew little to nothing about the Great Lakes. My very narrow-minded perception of the Great Lakes were that they were just vast bodies of water with not much going for them. And Lake Ontario specifically, well, let's just say I did not have glowing reviews. However, my previous uninformed opinions about the Great Lakes, especially Lake Ontario, could not be further from the truth. Through working on this campaign to establish an NMCA in Lake Ontario, I have had the pleasure of engaging in a multitude of conversations with individuals and groups from various sectors and, and how incredibly important this marine, marine ecoregion is, not only to wildlife, but to human livelihoods as well. Thousands of native species, globally rare plants, animals, and natural communities rely on the Great Lakes ecosystem, and it provides drinking water for millions of people in Canada and the US. These are just a few reasons why the Great Lakes are so great. My takeaway is this, the Great Lakes are a national treasure and a vital waterway and freshwater resource for Canada, and protecting it should not be an option, but a necessity. And it's time for Lake Ontario to receive some much needed love and respect. Beyond the incredible ecological values of the lake, supporting organizations of this campaign have opened my eyes to the many other aspects of Lake Ontario I did not know about previously. For example, did you know you can surf in Lake Ontario? 
Here I am post-surfing lesson with Maddie LeBlanc, professional athlete and manager at the Toronto-based surf shop called Surf the Greats, who have been an amazing supporter of this campaign. How about diving for shipwrecks? Did you know there are hundreds of sunken ships that lie on the bed of the lake, many of which are waiting to be discovered? Ken Fiegelman of Deep Quest Two Expeditions, another supporter of this campaign, will be uncovering more sunken history this summer. We look forward to engaging with and learning from many more organizations and individuals like the many of you here throughout this campaign. So we can't talk about the heritage of Lake Ontario without speaking to and recognizing the history and ongoing presence of Indigenous peoples across this marine ecoregion. Indigenous peoples have called the lands around and the waters of what is now known as Lake Ontario home since time immemorial. The movements and migrations of Indigenous communities in and out of this landscape have been shaped over time by wampum agreements, confederacies, amalgamations, colonization, conflict, disease, displacement, and treaty making. This complex history results in a myriad of interests and deep continued connections for Indigenous peoples to the lands around the waters of Lake Ontario, of which they continue to celebrate and safeguard through various means like water walks, similar to the one pictured here. Many Indigenous communities continue to fight for their rights to harvest around and access the lake. But there's an opportunity here to change that and make Lake Ontario a place of reconciliation. In this new era of protected areas establishment, we have an opportunity to learn from our past mistakes and establish new protected areas that respect the rights and support the cultural practices and ways of life of the original stewards of these lands and waters. So with all this being said, what is the opportunity here? The economic, cultural, and ecological values associated with the Great Lakes are indispensable and yet remain largely unprotected. However, there is an emerging opportunity for positive action and contributes to the federal government's effort to protect 25% of land and water by 2025 and 30% by 2030, as well as their goal of creating 10 new NMCAs in the next five years. We are pushing for the, col for the collaboration between the federal and provincial governments in close partnership with First, Nat First Nations to advance the establishment of new marine national marine conservation areas in the Great Lakes, starting with Lake Ontario. And to speak more about this opportunity in Lake Ontario is Gary Srinivasan, Director of Policy and Campaigns at Nature Canada. Take it away, Gary. Great, thanks, Sam. You can go to the next slide. Um, as Sam has mentioned, uh, given the federal government's commitments to expand protected areas across the country, the national call to support reconciliation and indigenous land conservation and the urgency of protecting the fresh water that we all depend on, we do have an enormous opportunity now to look at how to better protect the waters of the Great Lakes. So we're looking to grow support for this goal with your help, uh, starting with the National Marine Conservation Area or NMCA, as Sam has said, we'll often slide into that acronym. We wanna start with an NMCA on Lake Ontario. Next slide. So what is an NMCA? I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what they are, what benefits they bring, kind of the process for how we, um, we get there. And then we're gonna hear a little bit more about some of the key features of the lake from John at the SSJI. An NMCA is a federal designation from Parks Canada that is used across the country to protect both marine and freshwater ecosystems. So both ocean and freshwater. National marine conservation areas are basically like national parks for the waters. And each of the Great Lakes is a distinct marine ecoregion. The federal government has made it a long-term goal to ensure that each of these lakes is represented with an NMCA. But there are currently only two NMCAs in the Great Lakes region. There's the Fathom Five Marine Park in Georgian Bay, which is quite small, and the Lake Superior NMCA, which is quite large, that was established back in 2015. It leaves Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, the, greater, the lower Great Lakes, unprotected and that needs to change. If we can get progress towards protecting Lake Ontario, it can set the stage for other lakes to grow their protection as well. Next slide. So what areas could or should uh, the National Marine Conservation Area cover? As we'll see in a moment, it's really way too early in the process for anyone to begin drawing lines on a map for what the Lake Ontario NMCDA might look like. We're still years from that. But to give you a sense, you can see throughout this whole blue area of water on the map, 
um, the you know, possible region just in the eastern side. And really you can see what's at stake for nature in, in just this eastern part of the lake, which is the region that Parks Canada has identified as a candidate for an NMCA. These waters include um, no less than six critical important bird areas, as we call them, IBAs, stretching from Presque Isle Provincial Park all the way to Wolf Island. And that includes uh, Prince Edward County, which we'll hear more about shortly. This region is a biodiversity hotspot and it is critical for many at-risk water species from fish to turtles to essential pollinators like butterflies and migratory birds. Next slide. So what are the benefits of putting an NMCA in Lake Ontario? Some of you may be aware just how far the Great Lakes have come um, from a strong state of pollution, despite the many challenges um, that we've been through. There has been wonderful progress in improving their health over 50 years, but there is still a long way to go. And we know that most Ontarians live on the Lake Ontario basin, so it's really a system under pressure. It's pretty important that we need to lock in the progress that's been made to date to improve these waters, but then move to ensure their long-term protection. An NMCA designation will bring in federal investment to protect the nature that thrives there now and long-term stewardship dollars that can continually ensure that these crucial freshwater habitats are protected and restored where that's needed. Ensuring that future generations can benefit from ongoing improvement uh, if the, of the health of these waters. As mentioned, the region is important for many endangered and rare species. And so really in a world where we have a million species facing extinction, conserving this biodiversity hotspot is uh, crucial for nature. Establishing a national marine conservation area is also an opportunity, as we've mentioned, to maintain and improve indigenous use and stewardship of the lands and waters in full respect of the rights of local First Nations. And finally, an NMCA can also protect other aspects of cultural heritage. Sam mentioned hundreds of shipwrecks in the lake, and there are many still to be discovered. An NMCA would ensure that these wrecks are preserved and protected for all to both enjoy and learn from into the future. Let's look at the next slide. Just a quick snapshot, what does an NMCA allow um, or regulate? So the uh, National Marine Conservation Areas allow sustainable economic use of the waters, including for commercial and recreational fisheries, as well as shipping. Region recreational use of the site is also a permitted activity, as this has minimal impact on species and habitat. Certainly maintaining Indigenous use and stewardship of lands and waters is an important objective for Parks Canada of NMCAs and it will be critical to all these commitments in any new protected area being established in the Great Lakes, including respect for Indigenous priorities as it relates to management of the NMCA. There are, of course, also activities that would not be allowed on the site, on the site following designation because they are not consistent with the objectives of managing the area for conservation. This would include drilling in the lake bed for extraction like oil and gas or mining. It would include trawling the bottom of the lake as well as dumping on the waters. So these would all be prohibited. Next slide. So how does a designation happen? How do you get an NMCA? With this slide, I just kind of want to give you a sense of the formal process steps. Right now, we are early in the process. We're in the site identification phase. Um, meaning that a site has been identified uh, in Lake Ontario, but there has not been a formal initiation of the project by any level of government. We know that there is high interest in establishing an NMCA in the Great, Lake, uh, in the Great Lakes, and Nature Canada is currently now advocating that the provincial and federal government work together to initiate that next step, the feasibility assessment phase. This would be a one to one and a half year phase where a critical element would be detailed consultations with both First Nations, as well as local communities and stakeholder groups. Following a feasibility assessment, there would be a negotiated agreement to establish the site and its boundaries and formalize a management plan. And then lastly, the area would be protected with legislation. So we're at the very beginning and our campaign, hopefully with your help is focused on asking that federal and provincial government to start that feasibility assessment process and to start it this year in 2022. It's critical both to ensure the safety of nature 
and if this NMCA is to contribute to reaching Canada's target of 25% protection of land and fresh water, this feasibility assessment phase must start right away. Next slide. Just to say for our part of the, in the campaign, we've been conducting outreach to First Nations in the area to better understand their priority. We've been hard at work reaching out to stakeholders from the region, from museums and divers and surfers, community groups like the Lions Club, uh, farm groups and commercial fisheries. And we're connecting with local nature groups in the region like our partners at the South Shore Joint Initiative. Um, it's going to take all of us pulling together to make sure the lake is protected. The reception to the idea of having a National Marine Conservation Area to date has been extremely positive, but we're going to need more support to get that feasibility assessment process underway in a timely way, um, including to help determine what the boundaries could be. We think the eastern part of the lake is at least one key part of any future NMCA, and I'm going to let John explain why. And the, the next slide, my last slide, is just to give you information um, to end by saying that we have a lot more information on the NMCA, its potential, the process for achieving it, and what's at stake for nature in this report. So please check it out, and we're dropping the link to that in the chat as we speak. Um, so that's a bit of an overview of what is an NMCA and how we might get one. And now I'll turn it over to you, John, to talk about what's at stake in the eastern part of the lake in Prince Edward County. Thanks very much, uh, Gary. Um, I first of all like to start off by thanking the Nature Canada for this opportunity to participate in, in what is hopefully an, an educational session for all those um, online. Um, indeed, in no other part of Lake Ontario is there a greater confluence of land and water than Prince Edward County. We have 527 kilometers of shoreline on Lake Ontario, which is certainly greater than any other um, municipality of interest. So next slide, please. Back in 2018, um, the South Shore Joint Initiative um, was formed. And here are the logos of the nine organizations who came together to partner with us. The strength of this, strength of this partnership and the amazing advice and assistance we've received from, in particular, Nature Canada, have actually produced early results, as many of you folks know. The province is about to designate the first conservation reserve in 20 years on the South Shore, converting the um, uh, Ostrander Point Crown Land Block and the Point Peter Provincial Wildlife Area into an official conservation reserve. Next slide, please. So when we started um, South Shore Joint Initiative, of course, you want to have a vision and a mission, and we recently revised those. So the vision now currently is a permanently protected Prince Edward County South Shore where together biodiversity and people thrive. We need to recognize that human beings are part of biodiversity too. Next slide. And our mission is to educate and advocate for the protection, preservation, and restoration of South Shore lands and waters. Quite appropriate since we're talking today about an NMCA. And the next slide. So why save our South Shore? Well, in Southern Ontario, biodiversity loss is at its greatest and conservation opportunities are extremely limited. Prince Edward County's South Shore is the last major undeveloped shoreline on the North Shore of Lake Ontario. So protection of South Shore is vital to maintaining natural habitat. We are home after all to 39 species at risk and protecting the South Shore helps to provide an important contribution to biodiversity and mediate the effects of climate change. And it is of course a critical migratory bird flyway. Next slide. So on my map, which kind of follows on from um, the larger one that Gallery showed, here we're looking really at the the, the map of the uh, of the uh, Prince Edward County South Shore. So that purple outline is the outline of the waters which form part of the important bird and biodiversity area. Uh, the landmass is essentially all of the South Shore south of um, uh, Army Reserve Road, and on the map you can see the areas which are already protected in terms of land. Um, starting at the top, the uh, Prince Edward Point National Wildlife Area, uh, the Ducks Unlimited Land, Little Bluff Conservation Area, uh, the NCC's lands at Ostrander Point and the Maplecross Coastline Reserve, 
the Miller Family uh, Nature Trust in the middle. And then the two orange blocks are about to become the, um, we don't know what the name's going to be yet, but hopefully something like the South Shore Conservation Reserve. So much of the land is becoming protected and um, I would say that the waters are next. Next slide, please. So we've mentioned biodiversity, but what is biodiversity? Well, when we started SSJI, we spent quite a bit of time um, trying to develop uh, definitions because this really is important when we say we want to protect or preserve biodiversity. And this is what we came up with. Biodiversity is the variability among all living organisms from the microscopic to the visible and the ecological network of which they are part. This includes diversity within species, between species, and of ecosystems. This interdependence of all living things, including humans, supports life on Earth. Human well being and the survival of all species are intimately linked to healthy ecosystems. Every species in decline demonstrates how important the links of biodiversity and the ecosystems that sustain us are. So this definition, at, certainly at SSGI, this guides all of our efforts in respect of um, education, participation, and advocacy. Next slide. So that brings us to the relationship between land and water. We're all familiar with conservation areas, reserves, parks, et cetera, but not so familiar with the surrounding water. Hence this whole initiative to create um, national marine conservation areas. Lake Ontario was one of the least protected Great Lakes. The Eastern Basin of Lake Ontario, which has been prioritized for protection by Parks Canada, has critical conservation values, including for species at risk, migratory habitat, and ecological connectivity for adjoining terrestrial areas and the wider dynamic freshwater system of the North American Great Lakes. Next slide. So why is our IBA so special? We all know that it's really special, but a um, good way to look at this is the work that the uh, Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks did, the scientific work, in determining whether the two crown land blocks would be good candidates for conservation reserve. So they work with five criteria, ecological features, geological features, Ontario's cultural heritage and recreation. And they do a scorecard for each of these um, four criteria, sorry. Um, having gone through this process, we now know how it works. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the ecological and geological uh, features aspects. Next slide. So ecological criteria for conservation reserves are rated in terms of representation, condition, diversity, ecological function, and special features. And you get a report card on each one of those. In terms of representation, they have determined that our landform and vegetation communities are underprotected elsewhere in the eco district, therefore in need of protection. In terms of condition, the presence of large intact areas of alvar, wetland and shoreline continue to offer high ecological value, and obviously that needs to be preserved. In terms of diversity, um, the area supports moderate to high diversity at the species and landscape scale relative to other existing protected areas. In terms of ecological function, our region, our, our lands are the second largest among existing protected areas within the Eco District, with more than 12 kilometers of, of undeveloped Lake Ontario shoreline uh, between the, the two um, uh, crown land blocks, several hectares of wetland, some of which is provincially significant, connectivity with other natural areas. And of course, Prince Edward County South Shore is a very important uh, bird area for migration, stopover, breeding, et cetera. In terms of special features, species at risk, of course, are key. We have rare alvar communities, provincially significant wetland, provincially significant candidate ANSI, and of course, the important bird area as defined. Next slide. In terms of the geological features, um, we score well in terms of earth science. The evaluation determined that the sites are good candidates for protection under the Provincial Parks and Conservation Preserve Act, as they contain regionally significant earth science features, like notably the limestone shelves, again, where the land meets the water. Next slide. 
So now if we turn to some of the uh, aspects that uh, Nietzsche Canada has looked at in the report, which Gavri mentioned, and I really encourage everyone to look at this because this material is largely drawn from that. Um, we need to look at a number of, of systems like the local terrestrial ecosystem, the land system, local aquatic ecosystem, restoring and rehabilitating native fish species, support for species at risk, protecting migratory bird habitat and building ecological connectivity. So in terms of the local terrestrial ecosystem, the area supports many ecologically significant features, including globally rare and imperiled alvars, those are those areas of flat limestone or dolostone bedrock with thin or no soil that sustain rare ecosystems and tiny plants that are of great interest. And the world's largest freshwater sandbar and dune system located at least in part in Sandbanks Provincial Park. The unique conditions of this region make for a perfect environment for rare species to thrive, some of which occur in few other habitats in the world. In terms of the local aquatic ecosystem, the shallow waters of Lake Ontario's near shore zone are the most biologically diverse and productive in the lake, providing critical feeding and reproductive habitat for a multitude of species. Consequently, this area hosts the highest diversity of fish species. More areas of high ecological value have been identified in Lake Ontario than in any other North American Great Lake. And looking at restoring and rehabilitating native fish species, Protected areas that pre prevent habitat alteration have been found to contain a higher number of fish species. However, necessary protections of aquatic habitat are lacking throughout the Great Lakes. The lack of protection and slow pace of restoration of fish habitat is one of the greatest threats to the recovery of freshwater and nearshore aquatic species. Freshwater fish are particularly threatened by habitat loss and degradation from contaminants, land use impacts, and Aquatic Invasive Species, or AIS. So we need support for species at risk. Protecting and recovering species at risk in their habitat is a key component of conserving Ontario's biodiversity and is one aspect of the Ontario Great Lakes Strategy, which supports community work to protect Great Lakes habitat and native species. Species at risk play a key role in Lake Ontario's ecosystems and ensuring the protection of important habitats is crucial in their recovery and protection. An NMCA would be a crucial conservation tool as the designation would mean increased protection for species habitats and measures to prevent the introduction of AIS and prevent broader shoreline and water disturbance. Which brings us to one of my favorites and that's protecting migratory bird habitat. The IBA encompasses Prince Edward County South Shore, encompassing Prince Edward County South Shore is the largest in Eastern Lake Ontario followed closely by Wolf Island. It extends eastward from Point Peter to Prince Edward Point, covering 91 kilometers of combined land and nearshore waters and 30 kilometers of shoreline, which is one of Lake Ontario's few remaining undeveloped shorelines. At Prince Edward Point, nearly 300 bird species have been recorded, including tremendous numbers of white-winged scotter and long-tailed duck during migration and parts of the winter. These species numbers are often captured during migration with individual numbers reaching from 10,000 to as high as 70,000 in the case of dark eyed junco. Now, when we look at building ecological connectivity, which is really important, protected areas are significantly more effective in biodiversity conservation when they form a part of a greater ecological network. These networks connect species populations, maintain ecosystem function, and allow for the unimpeded movement of species and the flow of natural processes that sustain life on Earth. Prince Edward County is under moderate stress at the present time from loss of tributary connectivity, which is impeded by barriers along its length. In urban areas in particular, shoreline alteration negatively impacts natural processes while disrupting, disrupting connectivity of coastal habitats and contributing to wetland habitat loss. Development has hardened about 25% of the county shoreline, which can reduce coastline resilience, among other impacts. Addressing these drivers of loss of habitat connectivity and coastal habitat degradation by designing terrestrial protected areas to, to integrate the needs of freshwater species can enhance freshwater conservation without compromising on terrestrial protections. And my last slide, please. 
So there are threats, of course, and safeguarding against the threats will be important, and that's where an NMCA, you know, comes in. So key threat would be the possibility of over-industrial development in the lake. Um, folks may know that uh, the new county official plan uh, provides significant protection for the South Shore, uh, protecting from, you know, over-tourism development and so on, but there is still a tremendous amount of designated shoreland which is open for um, uh, tourism and resort development so we need to be concerned about that and any other type of industrial development you know uh, in the lake or on the shore and of course climate change is a threat to virtually everyone these days the news is certainly full of what the effects of climate change are and we see that particularly in the county where we end up with devastating uh, you know torrential rain events followed by uh, devastating droughts. And um, almost every year now, it seems we have uh, serious drought conditions and this can be blamed on climate change. So those are threats, I'm sure there's more. And what we really look forward to is that a, a National Marine Conservation Area is going to really assist with the protections that uh, keep these things at bay. So that's all I've got. And I guess um, later on, Sam, when we get to the questions and answers, I'll be available to, uh, to help answer them. Great, thank you so much, John. So if what you've heard so far today has inspired you to take action and get involved with this campaign, here are the current opportunities we have for you to do just that. So the first option is to send a letter of support for this initiative as an individual to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, David Ficini, and the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada, Stephen Gibo. So by clicking on the first link provided in the chat, so right now my colleague Michaela should be um, inserting a link. Um, once you click that link, you'll see that the letter is pre-written by Nature Canada, and all you have to do is fill in your personal information in the box to the right, and the letter will be sent to the ministers on your behalf. So these letters are gonna be sent until the feasibility assessment is announced. So hopefully sooner rather than later. So that's option one. Option two, so if you're affiliated with an organization and think that your organization might want to showcase their support on a group sign-on letter, then the second option is for you. We, currently, we are currently looking for organizations to contribute their name and logo to be added to a group sign-on letter of support sent directly to Minister Piccini and Min Minister Gibo as well. So the second link that Michaela is gonna to provide to you in the chat will provide you, um, will, will take you to a Google form page where you can read the letter. So if you go to the top of the Google form page, you'll see a link to the letter, you can read it first. And then, you know, once you read it, you can fill out your organization's information in the Google form, um, which will then contribute your organization's logo and information to be added onto the sign on letter. The deadline to fill out this Google form and contribute your organization's logo and name to the sign on letter is next Wednesday, August 3rd. And um, so these links will be sent to you via email for your convenience after this webinar. So if you don't get it down now, don't worry about that. About that. Just look out for it in the next 24 hours or so. So if we want to see Lake Ontario protected by 2025, we need the help and support of people and organizations like you for the long term, because your voice really does matter in this case. So here's our contact information for your convenience. Um, please feel free to reach out to any three of us at any time if you have any questions that might not be answered right now. Uh, but with that, um, we're gonna take the rest of the time. So we have quite a bit of time to um, uh, get, get to some questions in the Q&A. So bear with me here. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. And I think my colleague Michaela will also um, put the contact information into the chat as well for your convenience. So I'm just going to go to the Q&A, and um, I guess we'll get started with some questions. So the first question is, will this be recorded? It will. Um, we'll, we'll be sending the recording in the next 24 hours to all participants who, um, who signed up. So the first question we have is, um, is or has the impact of road salts on Lake Ontario been studied? 
do any of us have any insights on that, Gary or John? Um, I'm, I, I don't know if it's been studied in any in any depth, and that would probably be a good idea. But I, I do know that certainly in terms of uh, Picton Harbor, um, where there is where there has historically been, um, you know, the major salt transfer operation, road salt um, testing has been done by Ministry of the Environment uh, because of complaints about the very obvious entry of, of salt into the lake there. And what they found was that while there's localized impact right away, like in the very close water to the entry point, it dissipates very quickly. And they, it wasn't, in their view, um, really much of a threat. But on an overall basis, has you know, if you look at all the entry of, of road salt into Lake Ontario, I don't know if it's been studied more than that. Great. Thank you, John. Yeah, Gary, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say that there are some questions that I also answered a little bit in writing. So they're in the answered column. So just not to lose them in case others want to, you know, an opportunity to bring more. But there was an early question asking for information of some of the key partners in this initiative from Doug. And I was thinking whether you meant the key partners in the creation of the NMCA, which is a formal government process, and the key partners there. It's led by the federal government through Parks Canada, but they need to um, work collaboratively with the Ontario government because Ontario, of course, has authority and jurisdiction over things like the management of fisheries, and they currently have authority over the lake bed. So it's a in intergovernmental cooperative process, but it would become um, the main partner in the end for the overall management of the lake would be led by Parks Canada. And then there's an important open question as they undertake their obligations for consultations with First Nations about um, what, what the priorities and interests are of various nations um, that could end up having an influence over how the initiative is managed. But if you meant who are some of the key partners kind of in this agitating campaign, um, we are really interested in gaining more support. We've had great um, interest already. Sam mentioned some of the um, small organizations who we're, we named in the slide presentation from the um, surf organization and the shipwreck organization. We've been working with the museum in Prince Edward County. There are a number of organizations who have been helping us to sort of document, make the case, talk about the importance of the waters to different communities. SSGI, of course, is a huge partner in this and has been part of outreach to the provincial government. Um, and we're looking to grow it. And so that's why you've got the invitation through those sign-on letters that Sam identified. Um, so people can sort of be partners in a big way through mobilizing their organizations and their members, or if, you know, depending on the scope of your capacity, if you just want to kind of raise your hand and and uh, and engage by raising your voice with decision makers. We have some of those tools like the sign on letters. So different opportunities for people to be involved in the initiative. I just wanted to make sure I hope that answered the question that was on the other side. I'll get back to you, Sam. Great, thanks Gary. Um, on that note though, um, can, are you able to elaborate a bit more on the federal and provincial government's perspective? Um, yeah, any insights on, on that? Um, yeah, I mean, well, we, we know that Parks Canada has a, a has this as an objective to kind of um, have an NMCA on Lake Ontario. It's been on the books for a long time, also on Lake Erie, and our concern is that we need to see movement on it. And for that, they'll need to collaborate with the Ontario government. We have some early initial signs from the Ontario government that they would see this as um, complementary. John spoke about the um, terrestrial protection that the provincial government has been willing to um, get going in terms of the crown lands in Prince Edward County. And so the win-win scenario of having the adjacent waters also protected uh, and covered through ongoing investments federally is seen positively, but we still haven't seen actual action yet. So in our view, uh, the lake's not protected until the lake is protected. And so they have you know, formally said they're open and interested, but I think they need to see a groundswell of public support that we want it we want movement on this now and we want to see action this year for that feasibility assessment to get underway. Great. So just looking at other questions here. So here's a, a question for you. So are there any implications for the watershed rivers feeding into the proposed area? 
Might it mean help to protect or restore them? Yeah, I think, you know, what I love about this question is the questioner obviously has strong knowledge about the interconnections of our of our water systems. The lake is really connected to the rivers, the tributaries that feed it. And of course, the fresh waters eventually run into the ocean. And so it's really good that we always have these systems way of thinking. Uh, formerly, the National Marine Conservation Area, the management um, and the sort of attention to the conservation would be restricted to the boundaries of what where they decide it would be in the lake. So the NMCA wouldn't bring any specific action, I don't think, into tributary rivers, but there is, they have to monitor for the point about once it's designated and federally protected under legislation, they have to be monitoring for how to maintain the health and vitality of that ocean, of, of that lake. Um, and so I think it will help raise important questions about the health of the rivers. So the, the legal protection wouldn't extend out to other tributaries, um, but that would be part of what they would be um, needing to monitor is the points of entry, water levels, how things are being affected. And more broadly, I would say that the federal government has quite a few commitments in their, in their election platform around freshwater protection and fresh, you know, improving fresh water. So I think there's a lot of scope for us to grow um, attention to conservation of the rivers, even if not formally through the, the boundaries of the National Marine Conservation Area. I hope that helps. Great. Um, so let's get into a bit more of the, the diversity of, of Lake, Eastern Lake Ontario. Um, so there's a question here, uh, the rich diversity of fish fish species in Lake Ontario outlined by John is impressive, um, but probably isn't as well known as it should be. Are there ways to promote this going forward? Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, somebody should, right? Um, we're aware when we talk to scientists uh, of the very, the, the interesting nature of the east end of Lake Ontario is it goes from being very deep to as you get to the eastern end of the county, quite shallow. Um, and that's the reason for uh, the shipwrecks caused by the famous uh, uh, Marysburg vortex and so on. But that's what that shallower water is what promotes um, you know, different fish species and why we have such a, we still have a successful commercial fishery um, around the county. Um, uh, should there absolutely be more education done uh, for people as to, um, you know, the nature of the fish species and what they are and so on. Um, and maybe that can be part of this, you know, uh, a developing part of this campaign. There was an earlier question I noted too about um, what is the impact of warming water and it, that warming water affects fish species. I know I can't remember the names, but what we're seeing is some species just don't do so well as the water gets warmer and other species, of course, um, come in and, and populate the area uh, because they prefer warmer water. And, and that is, you know, that is happening now, um, which is, of course, a climate change effect. Great. And, and John, just to, to keep on SSJI um, related things. So a question from Neil is, are any of SSJI organizations participating in community-based citizen science, monitoring initiatives in addition to bird surveys? Um, and he gives the example of water quality monitoring for streams and drains. Uh, I guess the answer is yes and no. Um, uh, certainly um, the Prince Edward County field naturalists um, undertake um, uh, bio blitzes. Um, um, virtually every year there's a bio blitz done and documented. Uh, and that essentially looks uh, takes an area of the South Shore or the county and um, uh, documents numbers of species of you know plants and animals and birds and insects and so on. In terms of the water, there, there really isn't much in terms of surveying uh, going on now. I know that Quinty Conservation does some uh, water studies because they're concerned about the amount of phosphorus getting into the lake. Uh, and that was another earlier question too about what is the impact of, of streams and rivers coming into the lake. And um, conservation areas have been pretty successful in their campaigns to reduce um, uh, phosphorus getting into, into, uh, into the watersheds. Um, but yeah, there's probably a great need 
for more work on um, on surveying um, streams and, and and their contents. Great, thanks, John. Um, turning to more political questions, so uh, we have a question from Roger. Uh, he says we have a municipal election coming this <laughs> October. Do you have any allies among the candidates, or indeed any opponents? Sure, lots of allies. I mean, the current council has been uh, has been uh, pretty much pro environment. Um, uh, in fact, uh, you folks from Nature Canada uh, presented the NMCA some weeks ago to council and got quite a positive response. Who knows what happens in the coming election? So I'm not aware. Uh, when I look at the list of folks who are running so far, I'm not aware of anyone who would be, uh, you know, who'd be opposed to this. But um, I can say that SSJI will be um, uh, uh, organizing uh, a number of all candidates meetings with an environmental lens. In other words, the questions will be about the environment and NMCA will certainly feature in those. And that will give candidates an opportunity to, um, to, to say where they stand. Great, thanks, John. I'll just, yeah. I'll just add that we've had a strong letter of support also from the Brighton mayor. Um, and the notion of the importance kind of of municipal levels of government sending a signal about the importance of this as a local priority to the provincial government is a very good one. And so I would encourage people to be raising it in the context of um, their discussions with local candidates and looking for possibilities of how their councils can be um, formally indicating their support for that. Uh, there was an, an earlier question also about can the provincial government send a letter of support for this initiative. Uh, and yes, we what we need formally is for the Ontario government to indicate it's interested and willing to engage on this with the federal government. So we have our own sense that they will likely be in a position to do this, but haven't seen it yet. And again, that's why we're really urging you to join our letter writing campaign. The two ministers that Sam named, for those of you in the know, you're probably very aware, but just to be clear, the Stephen Gilbo is the federal environment climate change minister, and he's the minister for Parks Canada, uh, and is the one ultimately in charge of ensuring the process moves forward. Minister Puccini is the provincial minister for the environment. So those two, the provincial and federal ministers for the environment, need to be kind of encouraged to have that formal exchange with each other. And so we're we um, the letter writing campaign that you've seen in the chat. Uh, asks you as a citizen to urge Minister Puccini to, to do just that, is to, to, to send that signal to the government, to write a letter. Um, they, can, they can indicate it in many ways. It will take many meetings. Uh, and that's the kind of um, action that we're looking for. So thanks for asking that question. That was Paula. If, if, if I could just add that um, uh, David Puccini is a huge fan of the Conservation Reserve. I mean, he's, he's been to the county a number of times. He, uh, he, when we met with him at the end of January out at Point Peter for a, a photo op in the snow, um, he, um, he dazzled me with his knowledge of, of the status of the reserve project and uh, his knowledge of the county. And um, in discussions that we've had with him about the NMCA, he has expressed support, but that was just before the election and the provincial election. And um, hopefully now, as Gary said, the, the need of this is to get enough letters on their tables that they realize it's an important issue and we'll, we'll move it forward. Great, thank you both. Uh, I think this is a great question because I maybe a lot of people do have this um, confusion with DFO's role in all this. Um, so we have a question from Jamie. Have you communicated with Fisheries and Oceans about this initiative at all? Are they supportive? Um, Gary, if you can just take time to clarify uh, what DFO's role is in this or not in this? <laughs> yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a good question because there are formal protection instruments that different uh, you know, departments of the government has. The DFO uh, is largely, for example, creates um, marine protected areas through the Oceans Act and in the ocean context. So the freshwater NMCA is an Environment Canada um, responsibility through Parks Canada, its agency. So DFO would not be engaged in this um, freshwater lake protection, but we do uh, have a lot of you know, engagement and need to, to connect with DFO 
in order to have strong protections for both wide oceans and then NMCAs. Um, uh, yeah, there are there are saltwater NMCAs as well that uh, that happen and other kinds of protected areas like fisheries closures and other mechanisms that DFO has. So it's a good thought. And the short answer on this initiative is no, they're not relevant at this time. Thanks, Gary. So we have a question about uh, industry, possible industry pushback. So the question is, um, what are your thoughts about industry pushback to this request and how might we address that? Yeah, I, so I, I can start with that. I mean, we, um, you know, in the history of protected areas generally, that's not, not an unheard of concern, of course. And so we'll have to watch for it to date. We have um, a managed commercial fishery on the lake. Uh, there's both commercial and recreational fishing. There is uh, uh, commercial shipping. There is, you know, tourism along some parts of the lake. And so as John said, we want the NMCA, um, the NMCA will ensure a strong standard of, of thinking about what are sustainably managed economic activities for the lakes, um, but there are a number of activities that would be allowed. Uh, we have the example of the NMCA on Lake Superior, where there is continues to be um, active fishing. The province continues to, to manage the fishing. That's kind of an arrangement that the province and the feds worked out between them. So to date, our, um, our engagement and connection with industry groups has uh, continued to identify kind of support for this initiative and even an interest from the part of some of the fishing families because they have a strong conservation concern themselves. How do we ensure healthy fish stocks for the long term? We all know that when nature dies, if the fish stocks die, it's not good for any of the fisheries. Um, so to date, there is no, um, we have not seen any industry pushback. We want to make sure that there's lots of open dialogue that doesn't set up kind of any alarms about what the NMCA could be. We have two other active NMCAs on other Great Lakes. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, we'll have to see what, what issues emerge and we will um, need to be vigilant to ensure that uh, the, the ecological integrity and kind of the, the long-term health of the lake that serves all species, including humans, is, is what's managed as the primary objective. And that is the advantage of an NMCA because it creates a legislative context where the formal purpose of the NMCA is conservation and everything else has to be managed through that lens. And, including economic activity. So we're feeling um, pretty good for now and have done some outreach and the formal part of the feasibility assessment will help check that um, kind of stakeholder consultation that the government will do. Excellent, thanks Gary. So this might be a question for John or Gary, um, but Thomas asks, uh, could we also work to get bird habitat here recognized and protected under the Migratory Bird Convention Act? So I should know the answer to that question, and I don't. And I don't really. Um, uh, it's it's worth, certainly worth looking into. Seems to me when we were fighting the wind turbines and tried to use the migratory. Uh, Bird Convention that didn't have any weight at all with the with the tribunal, but um, that's not to say that it shouldn't be looked into for other other forms of protection. Yeah, I can comment that the Migratory Bird Act is not a super strong instrument. We were pleased that they have recently the federal government has recently updated the regulations, trying to clarify what would qualify. You know. What are areas, uh, what are key bird species that need to be listed, whose nests need to be not disturbed um, and trying to protect against uh, what they call incidental take. So I would say, you know, the Federal Migratory Birds Act is currently in force, it exists. So it does provide some level of protection, but the ability to sort of use it in a reactive way as a tool is less clear. They have not done a lot of enforcement with that act. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of like a rusty tool in the toolkit. And when I think in the long term that as a community, we need to, we need to improve and strengthen, but I will give credit where credit is due that the regulations after, you know, decades of 
being out of date have been very recently overhauled and there's a lot more clarity now both to protect and recognize um, Indigenous um, access and relationships and to clearly identify a number of species whose nests need to be protected during um, at all times and that includes for example the pileated woodpecker which was a bit controversial there was a whole question of whether they would be included, their nests would be included, because of course, as we all know, their, their nests are trees that stay there permanently, the holes are there and many birds use them. So it was a critical nest, kind of like a keystone species to protect. So some recent strengthening there of that act, but a ways to go. Thanks, Gary. Um, so we have a question, uh, a follow-up question from, oh, I lost my place, Paula. Um, if there's an opportunity here, Gary, for you to elaborate a bit more on what the process between the provincial and federal government might look like. So does it look like the provincial government sending a letter of support to the federal government? Um, is there any, can you elaborate a bit on what that processes might look like? Um, well, the next formal step is actually um, an agreement to, yeah, to launch the feasibility assessment. Um, and so we would love to see something in writing from the provincial government to the federal government indicating support to launch that feasibility process. Farther down the road, there's the, you know, what the provincial government support looks like changes quite a bit through those different phases of the establishment of the NMCA. Um, uh, as I say, you know, towards the end, an example is of course that they actually have to cede authority to the lake bed. Um, but we have, we have precedence for that. But the, the short term thing, what do we what do we want to see is um, a yeah, meetings between the two ministers, they've had they've had an initial conversation. Um, and we'd like to see a letter that goes from the Minister of the Environment in, in Ontario to the federal government. Um, and so there's a there's a whole level of interactions that have to happen between the department level and the political level. Um, so I, I just, I don't want to over summarize, like there's only one thing they need to do. It'll be a process of ongoing communication, but the, the, the easy way to think about it is if we can send in letters urging them to, to work together, um, they will know the specific actions they need to take, but a, a concrete written letter is a good example of that. So you can always amend your letter to say, please write to Minister Gubbo and indicate you want to get a move on with this process. Um, but the letter that we've set up provides a bit of details now on the, the kind of the asks that we have for both ministers. Great. And I think that's a great way to end off uh, the question and answer. If we weren't able to get to your question and answer, again, feel free to reach out to Gary, myself or John at any time you have our contact information. Um, but with that, I want to thank you so much for your participation today. Um, I hope you're, you're left feeling inspired and eager to get involved with this campaign. Um, if you have any questions about the take action options, um, please contact me. Um, again, look out for an email with all that information, the, the opportunity for those sign-on letters in the next 24 hours or so from me. But um, until then, I'm wishing everyone a great day. And again, thank you so much for uh, participating. Have a great day. Thanks all for coming out. Thanks everyone.